Oh, I'll sign this call. Good morning, y'all. So, yeah, All right. There are some who greet others and say, He is risen. And they reply, He is risen to the Lord. As we celebrate quote unquote Easter at this time, our first song this morning will be number 297. 297. <clears throat> Let us sing. The day of resurrection, earth shall in our abroad. The Passover of gladness, the Passover of God, from death to life eternal, from earth Traditionally, kind of ignored uh, religious holidays. Uh, you 
know, from a spiritual standpoint, we minimize Christmas. And my experience is over time we've done the same thing with Easter. And we, we talk about it and participate in all the other activities and do Easter egg hunts and all the rest of it. But uh, then we come back to our spiritual values and we don't want to call it Easter. <laughs> Uh, and I understand all that, but I don't want in any way for any of that to minimize our Lord has risen. Amen. And there's no greater phrase, I think, in human history than that. He has risen. I understand all the emotions at the tomb. Uh, they laid in deep sorrow. They laid their friend, their mentor, their savior to rest. The soldiers rolled a mighty stone in front of the tomb to keep him sealed forever. And then what we're going to be talking about in the course of the day today, the power of the resurrection. Uh, no grave can hold the Son of God. And you can seal it, make it as sure as you can. You can do everything to deny the access of our Lord, but he will come. And now we celebrate the fact that he will come again. We don't know when, but there will be a splendid morning sometime when all the angels are gathered together and the chorus is beginning to sing. And the Lord himself comes riding on the clouds as the figure of the scriptures there. I don't know of any grander way to start a day than thinking about the resurrection and the second coming of our Lord. I think our challenge is to be ready. I want us to turn uh, for our Bible study here this morning, and then we're going to talk about power uh, and the resurrection and our worship service. And I want us to turn to the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Um, you have probably noticed that I have uh, some strong leanings and affection for the book of Ephesians. I use it as a reference a lot. I frequently preach from it. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. One of them is, as we've been talking about in the Church of Asia on, on Wednesdays, uh, Ephesus was the great city of Central Europe. And it was a trading center. It was a center of religious worship and activity with the temples of Diana and Aphrodite and Paulus and others there. So when you come to the city of Ephesus, you're walking into an arena of people who are in many ways focused spiritually, however wrong that focus might have been. Now, the city of Ephesus uh, becomes a centerpiece for uh, the work of the Apostle Paul. He spent longer there than any place else, as we calculated, probably three and a half years altogether which is a long ministry for the Apostle Paul. He was very much an itinerant preacher. Uh, vocabulary wouldn't have been used in the New Testament, but he was not a located preacher to use vocabulary that was common in the church at one point in time, meaning somebody who came and stayed for a while. So Paul came to the city of Ephesus, and this is where he stayed for three and a half years. It was a city of uh, honor in the Roman Empire. Uh, had been honored as a free city, which meant it had complied with all the expectations of the Roman authorities for submission, practice of all the Roman expectations in honoring Caesar and all the rest. Because of its geographic location, it was a trade center, uh, east, west, north, south. It truly was a trade center. In addition to the land access for trade and economy, it had the Aegean Sea, which came to its doorstep, and it was there that so much of the commercial trade took place. Now, I say all of that because one of the things that's characteristic in the Gospel and the missionary work of the Apostle Paul is his choosing great centers for the ministries of the church. And we follow that pattern in many ways in the church today in picking great cities and sending missionaries and mission teams to those great cities. It's a great biblical example 
quite appropriate to use it. And so the Apostle Paul comes to the church at Ephesus, stays three and a half years, and this becomes, I think, one of his centerpiece writings. And I say that because he's going to lift up the church. And in doing so, he honors his master, Jesus, who made the proclamation, Matthew 16, on this declaration that I am truly the Son of God, I'm going to build my church. Uh, the following phrase, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, King James translation, I think plays in two different directions. One of them is the declaration that I'm going to build my church and the devil can't do anything about it. It's, it is going to be established in my time, on my terms, and in the nature I want it to be. It's almost a uh, I dare you kind of proclamation to Satan. I'm going to build my church. The second is a promise of the fulfillment of the ages in which the family of God has always been bound together in a fellowship of some sort. Now that was kind of loose and broad because there were two to three million Jews participating under the law. But nonetheless, they were the family of God who had been called out of the world, given special perks and blessings because they were the people of God. And they were the ones who were chosen specifically for the line of descent for the Messiah. Now one of the things that we're going to be talking about in the book of Ephesians is the power of God and working his eternal purpose. Now, I think it's a safe assertion. A person can only come into the world through one family tree. Would you agree with that? Yes. Uh, now you may have different branches and limbs, <laughs> but there's only one family tree. And when we come to the book of Ephesians, that's one of the things that's in the background, as I see it, for the Apostle Paul. Because the church is new, that's accurate. It is the next phase of God's plan for humanity. But it is the continuity from the early stages of God's activity in his people. When he said, through Abram and his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, what is the vehicle by which those blessings are going to come? In Old Testament times, the vehicle for God working among his people was clearly the law of Moses, the fellowship of the Jews. All of the practices they had, both in their personal life, in the tabernacle, and in the temple. And that was where God was at work in his people. The priesthood were the connection between God and man. And we need to keep that in place. Uh, I've heard people say along the way, we don't have priests in the church. Well, uh, that's biblically an error because we are all described as priests in our own right before God. But the most magnificent piece of all is that we have Jesus, the Son of God, who is our high priest. As a result of that, the word priest literally means, in its translation, a connection between. And that connection is between a man here and a God there, the reason the vocabulary was chosen. And in our life and work, that connection is between us and the Son of God. He is, he is our connection, our pathway to God. It's the reason he declared, uh, no one comes to the Father except by me. I am the gateway. I am the door. Uh, all, of the, all of the images that are used in the scripture emphasize that the way of access to God is Jesus Christ. Now, I've spent more time on that than probably essential. But so much of religious activity in the world today almost bypasses Jesus. And I want to bring us back to the reality that the centerpiece is always Jesus. And the avenue through which he's working in this world is his body, the church. And Paul was clear about that. That's the reason he lifted up the body of Christ the way he did uh, for the city of Ephesus. Any other comments or questions here about that introduction and Ephesus before we move ahead?
Anybody? All right, then forward we go. Let's read a little bit through the first part of this chapter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul had a magnificent view of God's people. He's going to be talking about the church, the body, but he recognizes that that body, as he wrote 1 Corinthians 12, is made up of many parts. And one of the characteristics of the Apostle Paul in his writings and in his ministry was his capacity to recognize and come in spiritually so many different individual people. And if his letters begin with those kinds of readings and blessings and thanksgiving, many of them end with a benediction that recognizes faithful servants of the Lord. He had an all-encompassing view of the fact that the body of Christ is the arena in which we work, and that body is the church. And so Paul says, beginning in verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I want you to think about that for a minute. I'm going to ask you to talk about blessings in Christ, what that phrase means, specifically what it means to you. Now, Paul also, and I think it's important to his message, to recognize in the beginning he moves us from earthly things to the heavenly realm. And to do that as dramatically as he does in the beginning, I think is significant. Now, it's, I think, automatic and to be expected that when we talk about the church, we're going to visualize people. Uh, that's what we do, unless we have a mistaken uh, perception that the church is the building. And then if somebody talks about the church, neglect, their mind goes to the building and a mental picture of that. But in this passage, the Apostle Paul puts in proper perspective that the church is the people. And it is in particular the people who are blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he also makes it, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, I'd like your responses about blessings in Christ. But he makes it clear that all of the spiritual blessings are delivered in Christ. We have debate in the spiritual world about what being in Christ means, number one. And we have a major dichotomy about the view of spiritual blessings, whether they're all within the kingdom of God or also outside. And the logical argument that people use, well, that uh, even the evil people got sunshine and rain and all the rest, that's correct. Because our God is a generous God and the rain falls on both the just and the unjust. But when it comes to spiritual blessings, that is spiritual life and spiritual power, spiritual motivation, spiritual fellowship, all of that is going to be found quite in Christ. And so when we proclaim the gospel and we invite people to come, we need to keep constantly in mind they're not coming just to meet the preacher at the front of the building, exchange a few words and take some appropriate action. They're in fact coming, as Paul described it here, to the arena of the place where God gives his spiritual blessings. And if you want those spiritual blessings, it's essential to come and participate in the body. Now, that's the reason, uh, I'm going to use preachers as the example, Randy indulge with me for a minute. It's the reason preachers get wound up sometimes about why people ought to come to worship. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not just a fetish. We're, we're not just counting people. Becky and I were talking about some records on the table in the fellowship room of uh, attendance records for the church. Now, those are fundamentally irrelevant documents as we talked about it because the real attendance role is God's role in heaven. Amen. And when we are enrolled in the kingdom, that's where we are enrolled. And 
that's where our names are placed in the book of life. So when we come to the body of Christ to receive spiritual blessings, it's a very clear declaration that spiritual blessings are found not in the world, not in the fantasies of man, but in Christ Jesus. And therefore, whatever it takes to get in the body, people need to do. That's the reason for the proclamation. Now, comments about what blessings in Christ means to you. Every spiritual blessing. You've got to have some thoughts about what that means. Uh, speak out for me. Okay, starting with, and Randy will be next. Becky's comment, forgiveness of sin. That's such an easy phrase to say, isn't it? Forgiveness of sin. But think of the magnitude of what that phrase means. The soul that sins shall surely die. And so if I am a sinner, unforgiven, what's going to happen? Not just an earthly tomb, but heavenly separation from God in the second death. And so if I want life, I'm going to find it where? In Christ Jesus. And forgiveness of sin comes in that access to the Lord as well. What else? When you think about blessings in the heavenly places. No. Pardon me? No. Love, okay. My hearing didn't connect, Leon, I'm sorry. Love. The, uh, the subject of love is interesting. Uh, I've read many times about how many poets have tried to express in uh, poetry uh, the concept of love. The volumes that have been written about love, the psychological diagnosis of what love is, uh, all those kinds of things are there. But love, 1 Corinthians 13, is pretty well clarified and spelled out and defined, if you please. But it's that love of God for his people that we're seeking when we come into the body of Christ. And that love of God giving us the forgiveness of sin isn't found out there in the fancies of man. It's found in Christ Jesus. The heavenly realms, not the earthly realms. Other thoughts? Uh, Paul, I'm going to rewind and take just a little bit from the blessing, but then back to your original comment, the Apostle Paul ran into the problem in, Col in Colossae that uh, some thought that Christ was not totally sufficient. And so he uses a, a term, pleroma, to the Korean and the Greek word, that is, fullness. And over in Colossians chapter 2 and 9, he said, in him, that is in Christ, dwell all the fullness of the Godhead body or deity. Everything comes to point uh, in Christ. And so Gnosticism uh, weeded its way into the early uh, thoughts of Christianity to try to tell the Christian that Jesus was good, but he wasn't really all sufficient. And so they needed intelligence, and the intelligentsia began to uh, have an effect on the church. And so Paul, in several places, talked about the fullness, the totality, sufficiency of Christ, no matter where he went. Right. And the, uh, yes, Betty? Well, we have the hope in Christ, which is really important. And he's faithful to his promises. And he's told us he's never going to leave us. And the biggest blessing for me, I think, is the avenue of prayer that we have. Absolutely. And many times in my life I've been told in prayer to maybe the number one blessing <laughs> that we have uh, because prayer gives us our access to God. We have the chance to talk to Him. He answers our prayers, talks back to us. Because, uh, it would be hard to find a blessing, spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus that means more than prayer. And over the years it's been fascinating to me the circumstances in which and the people whom have asked for prayer. Uh, I was in a hospital room once upon a time with a family whose teenage daughter 
one of those crazy teenager things and been riding on the front fender of the vehicle, fell off and had some here serious head injuries. Uh, the family were not spiritual people. Uh, her father had, as a matter of fact, denied the reality of Jesus in family conversations we'd had before. I was startled when I came into the room and asked how things were going. And he said, Paul, I really need you to pray. And that for me was one of the great examples in our lifetime of the fact that unfortunately in crisis time, more than any other time, we call on the Lord. I don't think that's wrong. Uh, we had a friend once upon a time who was talking about prayer. She was teaching ladies wonderfully about prayer. She wanted to talk about the problem she had. Many times in her evening prayers and devotional, she would fall asleep while she was praying. And I think I've shared this before. My response to that was, how could you find a better way to end your day than falling asleep in prayer, talking to the Lord? Uh, and that's the kind of thing that I think Paul is getting to when he talks about spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, yes. When every granddaughter was born, it was a very traumatic day because um, Piper's heart stopped and what was a normal happy occasion became a very scary thing. And we all were in the waiting room and uh, we circled up and prayed and we were so pleased that everybody that was sitting in the waiting room said, we'd like to be a part of that circle as well. Can we pray with you? So that was very, you know, to be able to find people to the fellowship that we enjoy that our right. kindred spirits with us with prayer as well. Uh, the, uh, I think of the time in the interior of Brazil we would have asked you to visit with a young man who was the only Christian in Governador Valadores, which is a city of 150,000 population. And as we came to him, he had two questions. One is, did you bring it? And he was asking about the Lord's Supper because where he was, he had to get his communion from the liquor store. Uh, it was the only place he could go. And he was very humiliated that he had to go to the liquor store uh, and be seen there literally buying liquor. But that was his need. The second was the communion bread. And he had no way of acquiring that except the Christian missionaries bringing it to him. So here's a man eagerly waiting, did you bring it? <laughs> uh, and clearly with a sense that when we talk about in remembrance of me, the language of Jesus, the memory of him was accentuated in these cases by not being able to participate and being away for a while and the hunger for the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus, including prayer, were the things that were critical. Others. When I think of blessings, I think of the talents that Charles gave us and how we use them as it relates back to the parables. All right, I think that's an excellent point. Thinking of blessing uh, brings to mind the talents as the Lord distributed them. Excellent point. Uh, many people do not view the assignment for work as a blessing. Is that a fair statement? <laughs> but I really appreciate by the way you're positioning it that way because working for the Lord Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 don't become weary in well doing uh, and I know that you all have experienced the joy of new Christians that can't wait to talk to somebody else they're eager to come to worship etc uh, but after time that tapers off uh, they lose the enthusiasm and the vitality. And part of it, unfortunately, is through osmosis by some of the other people in the church who have had their diminished faith and spiritual life over time. That's not a judgment. Uh, it's a description. But this spiritual blessing in the body of Christ and the power of prayer is one of the greatest ones of all. It's a way we bring God into our life. And he, as a father, wants us to talk to him. We recognize that. Those of us who have children, uh, if your children never wanted to talk to you, that's a miserable time, is it not? Yeah. 
you, you recognize there's something seriously wrong somewhere in that parent-child relationship. You don't want to talk to me. But this, he blesses us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Prayer could easily be at the top of that list. Other thoughts here before we move on. Blessings in Christ. Larry? We talked about the Holy Spirit. Give to the Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, Christ left us with the Holy Spirit uh, when he left this earth. And there are all kinds of blessings that, that come to the, to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I thank you for mentioning that and bringing it into the conversation. We don't talk enough about the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, if, you, if you want to be an orphan, <clears throat> don't talk about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> because that's the way Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit to the life of his disciples. I'm not going to leave you fatherless. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Uh, he's going to go away, but he gave them the promise of the Spirit to stand by them, empower them spiritually, reveal to them everything they needed to know, guide them in their actions, empower them for the divine work. Excellent. Yes, Joe? Uh, where do we know is the eternal, the promise of the eternal life. That's the biggest thing I think that we can count. The promise of eternal life. Yep. Kind of let that hang in the air for a minute. The promise of eternal life. What does that phrase mean to you? And you may not need to answer. That may be a rhetorical question that's best answered within yourself. What, what does it mean, the promise of eternal life? Remember that God has kept every promise that he ever made. And so when he promises eternal life to the faithful, it's going to happen. It's already a current reality. It is as true 2,000 years in the future in the mind of God as it is today, April the 4th or whatever the day is today. And that's the promise of God, which is the fulfillment in spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to make one more pass. Other thoughts here about spiritual blessings? I think the most important thing is God's no respect of person. So if you got a lot of money or you're poor or mentally or whatever, God has no respect for person. And I uh, thank you, Gwen. That, that is a concept which is exceptionally difficult to grasp. Now, we, um, but God is no respecter of persons. There is no standard which makes one better than the other. Is that a fair statement? Uh, it doesn't make any difference where you're from geographically, who your family tree were, what color your skin is, what dialect of any language you speak. All of those things are secondary to the reality that we are souls in the body of Christ and in the family of God. And God is no respecter of persons among that. Now, different people have different levels of blessing. Would you agree with that? But that's because they are actively seeking the blessings of God and doing the things that would increase the blessings. Now, we, we were discussing employees in the workplace one time. And my manager said, you know, if I have two people in the room and there is a task out there and one of them is starting to ask questions about it and wanting all the details about it and the second one says, I'd like to get busy about that, which one are you going to choose? <laughs> That's pretty straightforward, isn't it, Larry? The, uh, and I think about that in the kingdom. You know, if, if I'm waiting for something else to happen so that I can really enjoy the blessings of God, that may be the wrong approach. What I need to be into is, as Paul talks about here, the spiritual blessings are in Christ. And I need to seek that if I want to receive the blessing. Now, let's move ahead a little bit, beginning in verse 4. I hope we've talked enough about the word for and the word therefore or wherefore as Paul uses them in his writing. 
And so when he says for, that means because of the things that we've just talked about. And the things we just talked about are receiving the blessings of God in the family of God. Because of that, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will. Now, we need to read and reread and let those words sink <coughs> in. Because there are no accidents in the spiritual world, no accidents with God. Uh, as Paul described it here, everything took place in the foreknowledge of God. Even our calling for the blessings in Christ Jesus, he says, and we have real trouble in the spiritual world with this word, predestined us to be adopted as children. Now in the religious world, predestination is treated too strongly, which means you, Bible, were chosen by God because of the favor of your character, and if you don't want to be a servant of God, sorry about that, God chose you anyway. Some people, some people view this that way. I'm saying that's not a very pretty picture. But what really is about is God wants servants in the kingdom, and He has laid out a plan by which people are ready to be adopted in the family. And that adoption is a process which has to be pursued by the orphan who's looking for a spiritual home. And so the spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. And it is in love that he predestined us. Now what that means is if you want adoption and you want to pursue that and you're willing to abide by the terms, then we have a deal struck with God. I'm going to use the word advisedly. We have a spiritual contract with our maker. Because God repeatedly through the scripture says, if you'll do this, I'll do this. And if you refuse to do this, then I will refuse to do this. Uh, some people get really troubled by uh, make, that making God an arbitrary God. No, it makes him a just and equal God. He is into the nature of character and service. And if you do this, I'll do this. Why should he fill in the blanks? And you say, I don't want to do that. Well, I'll do my part anyway. Now, open to the reality, God blesses both the godly and the ungodly. Understand all that. But the specific spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus are given to those who were predestined to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ and in accordance with the pleasure of his will. Now, why would God do all of that? Why work at all of these things through history? Paul has a simple phrase, to the praise of the glorious grace. God wants a family. God wants to be honored as God. He wants to be respected as holy. He wants to be treated as the master and the Lord of everything. So the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus are given so that God's people can lift a chorus of praise and glory honoring God. What a beautiful spiritual cycle. God says, I'll bless you if you do these things, and when you do these things and I bless you, then we have fulfilled the eternal destiny that God promised to, through Jesus Christ. All right, our time is finished. We'll pick up at that point next time and talk a little bit more about God's eternal purpose. Thank you for presence and participation.